Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Culture and Health Webinar Series 2020. My name is João Nunes, and I'm the co-director of the Center for Global Health Histories of the University of York. This is our second Culture and Health Webinar of 2020. This series is a collaboration between WHO Europe, the University of York, and the University of Exeter. The purpose of this series is to bring together experts from the humanities and social sciences with senior officials from the WHO and the wider UN system and wider publics to exchange ideas about important global health topics, exploring the social, historical and cultural context of health. The seminar also doubles as number 147 of the Global Health Histories seminar series of the center in which I'm co-director. Our topic for today is a puff of smoke, what next for tobacco control? 2020 marks 15 years since the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control came into force. This was an important development in global health governance in that it included extensive multi-sector collaboration and involvement of different UN agencies and international organizations and an opening towards civil society participation. This framework convention also signaled an important shift in global health governance beyond the focus on infectious diseases and towards other kinds of public health issues that can be considered also urgent. The Framework Convention of Tobacco Control is today facing important challenges. The tobacco industry strategies to circumvent this convention continue to evolve. At the same time, we are witnessing the growth of new and emergent products, such as e-cigarettes and heated tobacco. In the run-up to World No Tobacco Day, which is going to be on the 31st of May, this webinar explores the historical, social and cultural contexts that have shaped tobacco control policies in the WHO European region. The webinar is based also on a new publication, Cultural Contexts at a Glance, which focus on the history of tobacco control with an emphasis on the European region. The download link of this publication can be found in a tab on the Slido box. During this webinar, our panelists will spend the first 30 minutes presenting their own perspectives on tobacco control. The remaining 30 minutes will be dedicated to discussion, including questions from you, your, our online audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Slido box. You can scroll down the Slido box uh, to the Slido box and post your question there. Alternatively, you can go to www.slido.com and enter the event code hashtag WHOCH, that's hashtag WHOCH. You will also be able to vote questions up or down. Let me introduce our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. First, Virginia Berridge is a professor of history and health policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he's, she's the author of the document Cultural Context at a Glance, Tobacco Control in the WHO European Region, which we're also launching today. Our second speaker is Christina Mauer-Stender, Program Manager of Tobacco Control at WHO Europe. And finally, Anka Toma Friedlander, Director of the Smoke Free Partnership. So, without further ado, let me pass the word to Virginia Barrage. Virginia, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm a historian, so obviously I'm going to speak from a historical perspective about tobacco use and policy in Europe um, from the earliest arrival of tobacco up to uh, the near present. So I'm going to cover the past, but also some recent changes uh, the changes in Eastern Europe, uh, the coming of the Framework Convention, and also some very recent um, developments too, like e-cigarettes. Well, Europe has had a very long-standing relationship with tobacco. Um, within 50 years of Christopher Columbus uh, going to America and bringing um, and tobacco coming back to Europe, it made its appearance in the Portuguese court at Lisbon. And in England, tobacco was a mass consumption commodity by the end of the 17th century. 
and people were using it in, in different ways. Some people smoked clay pipes. Uh, in Southern Europe, uh, cigars were more common. But an important change came in the late 19th century when mass production came in. The Bonsack rolling machine enabled the development of mass production cigarettes. And that was a crucial technological development which drove the expansion of smoking in uh, many European countries. So by the end of the Second World War, uh, smoking was the norm in most of Europe amongst both men and women. There had been concern about the harmfulness of tobacco, even in the 19th century, um, but it wasn't a major part of uh, any public health movement. Uh, there were some small anti-tobacco societies and very often they were connected, uh, like alcohol at the time, with the temperance movement. But certainly tobacco was nowhere such a big issue um, as alcohol was at that time. And the first country which began to be concerned as a nation uh, with tobacco was actually Germany in the 1930s under the Nazis. And their smoking was connected with the kind of racial hygiene, eugenic ideas of the time. But the main uh, change, I think, came after the Second World War uh, with the path-breaking research of Richard Dodd and Sir Austin Bradford Hill, which took place at my own institution, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And they established what they called a real association between smoking and lung cancer. And similar research um, happened in the United States at the same time. And that chimed very much with changes in public health at the time, which have already been referred to. The big epidemiological transition um, after the Second World War away from infectious disease towards chronic disease and a new role for public health focusing on individual lifestyle. Style. and smoking was absolutely central to that change in public health. Um, among the first European country to, to take the issue up was, was in Britain with the reports uh, which came out from the Royal College of Physicians in the 1960s and the 1970s. But other countries in Europe took it up, the North Karelia project in Finland and Norway as well, uh, were very early adopters of um, a different response to smoking. And then tobacco control started to become an international movement from the 1970s. At first that was primarily um, an Anglo-American initiative, but later it expanded within Europe. Um, WHO Euro um, uh, Central Headquarters in Geneva recognized its importance uh, with input from Scandinavian interests. And there was an international public health coalition which developed uh, with Canada and the United States, as well as European countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and the UK. And these were all considered leaders um, in the new public health. Then moving on into the 1980s, it was then that the European regional organizations uh, took up the issue. And for WHO Euro, this was part of the movement for primary health care uh, established at Almorata in 1978. And emerging in Europe and in North America through the Ottawa Charter of 1986 as health promotion. Uh, and health promotion was a movement in which WHO Euro played a big role. In particular the healthy cities movement across Europe which for community the EU also at the same time it developed a new responsibility for public health and its first action plan on cancer in the late 80s um, had smoking playing a key role. The tobacco industry perhaps surprisingly was relatively inactive uh, in the European Union at this time. It didn't have the sort of lobbying arrangements in place which came later on. Um, and so in the uh, EU, between 1989 and the early 1990s, uh, there were seven directives and one resolution on tobacco. And I think these had a major impact on tobacco control. 
and alongside that went the development of European anti-smoking networks, uh, the European Network on Smoking Prevention, uh, European Network on Young People and Tobacco and so on. Other issues came onto the agenda like smoking, um, smuggling and um, also uh, the issue of harm reduction which has come back more recently. Um, in 1992, SNUS, uh, a Scandinavian um, smoking, uh, chewing smoking product uh, was banned for use across Europe. Well, the next big change was the fall of communism and the impact it had on tobacco consumption in Eastern Europe. That was a perfect storm of change with international financial organizations pressing for rapid economic reform and tobacco industries such as British American Tobacco persuading cash-starved governments that they would reap rewards from their investment. So the tobacco transnationals penetrated uh, markets in Eastern Europe before uh, there was effective tendering processes and they replaced the old state monopolies. Um, but in some countries such as Poland, anti-tobacco activities were successful with a decline in Poland in the 90s of uh, about 10%. Of course, the highlight of this period uh, was the passing in the early 21st century of the Framework Convention of Tobacco Control, which has already been referred to. And that moved forward um, more swiftly when Gro Harlem Brundtland became Director General of WHO in 1996. There was a long history of internationalism in Europe, but the focus at that time was more on smoking and developing countries, I think. Anyway, what's happened since then, things obviously have not stood still. And I'll just mention three things, smoking in public places, the, revival, uh, the, the arrival of ENDS, uh, and also what's been happening in Eastern Europe. Well, firstly, smoking in public places. There's been a ban on smoking in public places in countries such as Ireland, uh, which led the way, then followed by Italy, Scotland, Turkey, Norway, and the UK. And that's been a very successful initiative, which I think some people was, thought was not going to be accepted by the public, but the public have um, accepted it very freely. Virginia, um, please wrap up. Okay. Um, uh, E-cigarettes, still a matter of controversy, uh, whether they're harm reduction or um, uh, amplifying the harm of smoking. Um, and finally, rates of smoking in Eastern Europe are high, but in recent countries, some countries have passed significant legislation. So finally, it's an ongoing story. Uh, the nature of public health may be changing with the arrival of COVID, but certainly um, the, uh, the smoking has been, uh, control has been a long-standing story in which I think we need to know about smoking culture as well as about smoking policy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Virginia. Thanks for your wonderful presentation. Uh, Christina, can I pass over to you? Thank you very much, Joao. And um, I would like to take a moment here uh, to appreciate how far we have come. 2020 is uh, an important year because it's 15 years since the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control back in 2005. And so there have been some major victories since 2005, which I would like to celebrate here together with you. Almost 5 billion people around the globe are now protected by at least one best practice in tobacco control measures. And this is four times more people than back in 2007. This is first. Second, over a billion people are now protected by high taxes on tobacco products. We know taxes are the most, single, most effective single tobacco control policy to save lives. And 2.4 billion people around the globe, meaning around the third of the world population, now have access to cessation services uh, provided at the press practice level. And these services help people make the first powerful step to rejecting tobacco. I think we should be proud of those changes we have collectively made. Despite the aggressive opposition from the tobacco industry, we have helped 
hundreds of thousands of people struggling with tobacco addiction, empowering them to take control over their own lives and destinies. However, there is much which remains to be done. And this is especially uh, seen in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. We know that in European region, only six countries will be achieving the globally agreed, agreed target, 30% of relative reduction in tobacco use by 30% by 2030. This is only six countries out of 53 European countries. The picture is particularly challenging with the regard to gender and tobacco use in the European region. We are the only region globally that will miss its prevalence reduction targets among women. And I don't think this is a cause for celebration in one or another way. The tobacco control landscape since 2005 has also substantially changed. As we become more advanced, more groundbreaking and innovative in our tobacco control actions, building coalitions around the globe for smoke-free future, the industry too, tobacco industry, has become more inventive and more aggressive than ever before. One of the big trials I know we're all now facing, and Virginia was also mentioning that, is what some of us call novel products, novel tobacco products, such as e-cigarettes e and heated tobacco products. Those are highly addictive substances made of cocktail of toxic, and in some cases also carcino carcinogenic chemicals that cause harm both to the user and to those around them. And I think the greatest danger perhaps here is the unknown damage. We don't know enough about those products yet. At the same time, they are strategically marketed to our kids and young people in all of our societies. And the protection of whom is also the team of the World No Tobacco Day on the 31st of May, as you, Joao, already mentioned in your introduction. Through a combination of product design and influencer promotion, the world youth are graduating towards these products despite of the danger and despite of the unknown. However, there is a hope. We can see across the European region, but also across the world, that countries are standing up to the innovative and threatening tactics of the tobacco industry, and we are winning. And let me give only a couple of examples from countries, part of European region of WHO. Take Georgia, the country where male population, adult male population used to smoke more than 50%. We have seen that since the adoption of their law, as a result of the fantastic cooperation between the government, parliamentarians, NGOs, media and academia, we have already seen the decline in their smoking prevalence. We don't see the advertisement, we don't see the billboards, and we see also people being happy and fully supporting the measure. And this goes for the smokers and non-smokers. And I think it's, a, as I said, it's a fantastic achievement. We can also mention here Ukraine, a bit closer to the Western Europe, European Union, where we have seen that the last seven years, there have been 20% decline in smoking prevalence among adult population. And this is what we want to see, despite of tobacco industry aggressive strategies. And I think those are just the two changes in Georgia and in Ukraine, but I do think they are inspiring changes. And it is important to recognize that stepping on addictive substance for another will not empower individuals to take control of their own health and their own lives. But to conclude, we have to gather our strengths for the coming years, 
leading us to 2030 sustainable development goals, but also beyond. We find that in the collective power of collaboration and the intelligent use of those tools which we have, such as WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, we can go a long way. And with these resources, we stay ahead of those who are determined to put profit before healthy life, and we champion the cause of tobacco-free future for all in Europe and around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Perfect timing. Well done. Thanks very much. Uh, can I give the word to Anka? Anka, over to you. Thank you, Joao, and thank you, Virginia and Christina, for your introduction and remarks. Um, I come from a from an advocacy or organization, and our mission is to achieve successful FCTC implementation. Uh, so I will pick up from where Christina left and um, make my remarks along three uh, three broad lines. The first um, thing that I wanted to to talk about was. Um, this uh, this idea about the role of culture in uh, the, sh the in shaping the regulatory choices that countries make uh, that Virginia's paper has discussed um, has discussed a bit, but I wanted to flip it around as well and um, talk about the role of regulation in shaping the cultural uh, the cultural norms. So if, for example, Europe has a long-standing relationship with tobacco, we can see that changing um, uh, and um, we can see how post-implementation tobacco control regulations become more and more popular and that there are so many countries in Europe right now where uh, uh, smoking in public places is a thing of the past. It's been just a few years or it's been a long time, but people can't even imagine going back to that. And that is a significant change in culture that can be achieved through regulation. Um, and of course, uh, another, another thing that, um, that influences the, the culture around tobacco use is uh, the amount of uh, restrictions placed on the promotion of tobacco products. Uh, these, uh, these are not about lifestyle choices, as Christina uh, mentioned before. Uh, you, you can't talk about uh, lifestyle choices when you're talking about an addictive product that is marketed to children. Um, at the same time, the ubiquity of promotion of tobacco has an impact in um, in blocking and delaying the cultural acceptance of, of tobacco control regulations and, and as a result in the decline of smoking. So um, I, I would make the case for the flip side of it and, and say that regulation shapes culture and our goal is to transition to a world where the cultural norm is no tobacco. And, and that is uh, an interpretation of, of uh, what uh, Endgame is, uh, is called. The second uh, thing that I wanted to touch upon, and it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, again, not quite a repetition, but a, a slightly different approach to, to the uh, SDG uh, objectives. Uh, it is uh, that especially after this, uh, the, the, the crisis that we're going through right now, the public health crisis that we're going through right now, I cannot imagine a future where uh, public health measures, public health policy and prevention will not be a key part of the, the health and the economy of nations. And, uh, and I think it's just a matter of time, but in the, in the context where people are living longer and healthy life years have become such an important thing to achieve, you cannot possibly achieve that without tobacco control and without prevention policies, solid prevention policies to support the resilience and sustainability of health systems. Uh, and it's important also because that requires a change of paradigm. We have to shift from this idea of um, 
uh, choices and lifestyles to the, the determinants of health. This is happening already. And we have to incorporate in the determinants of health, not the lifestyle ones, but the commercial ones. And that also goes into, into the uh, promotion of tobacco products, which is way too uh, widespread still. The third point that I wanted to make uh, is about the future of tobacco control and the future of the framework convention and its implementation in, uh, in Europe and the world. Uh, it is time that we stop laying catch up to the tobacco industry. Uh, and uh, we are able and we have a lot of science and a lot of data to um, identify and I anticipate some of the tactics that it, uh, that it is using from exploiting the tiniest loopholes uh, in, the in the fabric of, of policies, just sort of spreading, uh, spreading those tiny um, pores wide open to, to stick new products, to stick new strategies through. Uh, f uh, to buying good graces and influencing policies. Uh, I'm, I was looking at uh, our latest data. The tobacco industry is spending nearly 10 million euros to influence the EU every year. 100 people, 10 million euros every year. And this is something that we are playing catch up as a health community. Um, and uh, we already know that the tobacco industry instrumentalizes science, that it promotes, uh, promotes its products old and new to children. Uh, and uh, uh, with that, we need to reach a point where politically tobacco control is a priority, where politically tobacco control is recognized and funded and prioritized adequately. Um, I think I'm going to stop here because uh, several of the questions that were asked are going to allow us to, to continue this. Thank you, Anka. That's great. Um, we already have a number of questions from our audience. I'm trying to kind of summarize and bring them all together here. Perhaps we could start, I mean, just kind of following up from, um, I think, your presentation, Anka, and also Christine also talked about um, the role of the industry or the shifting role of the industry. It seems from what you've suggested that there is, uh, that there are some changes underway in terms of how the tobacco industry industry is relating to the public, is related to, to policy. Um, one of our uh, audience uh, um, uh, members has suggested that there has been, I mean, I don't know if this is, uh, uh, there is no evidence of this, but the, 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 the audience member has suggested uh, that there seems to be a lot of cases of generous donations made by the tobacco industry for the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. So I guess my question is for you, what is, um, how is the industry changing? What are the challenges that uh, uh, these shifts in and these new marketing uh, strategies by industry and the way in which industry has learned to circumvent some of the clauses of the FCTC. Um, what is happening and what can we do about it? And perhaps um, Christina may also want to jump in and I think she, she also will have interesting things to say and even uh, Virginia. Uh, the, if that was a question for me, uh, if this is something that we have um, uh, we have recently approached in a, in a statement of, of the smoke-free partnership. Um, uh, you know, personally, I think a mask is a mask and a ventilator is a ventilator. And, um, uh, and uh, in this time of crunch, I think it would be perhaps not uh, quite right to say uh, this is wrong. But um, tobacco industry sponsorship is illegal in, in a lot of European countries. Um, most of the EU, all of the EU countries and, and a whole lot of the, of the uh, Euro region countries. So um, I think it's important that governments do not allow the industry to profit from these gestures. And, uh, and that is a role of policymakers. 
we have to call it out as a civil society, uh, but, uh, but the role of governments is to not allow the, what happens after to happen, the, the influence and the good graces. Uh, uh, Christina, do you want to um, jump in on this? Yes, I do. I, th I think it's a very uh, current um, discussion what we see on, on social media, tobacco industry uh, sponsoring in different countries. Most of the time, the poor countries of the region, the support to COVID-19 uh, work. And, and of course, I think it is very tough times for many countries uh, because the need is huge. At the same time, I think um, we, the decision makers, the ministers of health, shouldn't allow the, the, the tobacco industry to present itself, even in the most acute situations, as a good co a corporate re social responsibility player, to be part of a solution, sit around the table where the decisions are made for health, because they're not. I mean, they, they are selling the cigarettes, um, which are still most consumed in Europe. 28% of adults use cigarettes and not novel tobacco products. Therefore, I, I think we should, we should look what they truly do. They are pe making people sick, right? And, and then coming in in the most acute situations for many governments is not what they should be doing. And this is not what we should be accepting as a health community and as a decision makers. Um, I also do think that uh, the broader, I think your question was broader than just the tobacco industry and COVID-19 uh, challenge, what we're all living. I also do think that, that to some extent, um, tobacco industry has managed to split also the health community. I think instead of standing at one front, strong together, I think that e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products have split the global tobacco control, control community into two instead of being one strong front. And, and I don't want to be naive. I think this is one of the successes of tobacco industry. Virginia, I don't know if you want to say something about the um, issue of industry and um, do you have any observations about this? Well, I think um, I don't have any observations on their new marketing strategy because it's not an area that I know much about. Um, but I don't think I agree that the response to nicotine products is just something that's um, stirred up by the tobacco industry. Certainly in my own country, in England, uh, where there has been a, a different response um, and much more um, public health support, although obviously debate over that. And so uh, although the industry obviously gets up to um, some things which we would deprecate, uh, I don't think they're just totally... Uh, behind the policy response to to e-cigarettes. Thank you. Let me just take that lead because um, you mentioned the, the UK case, Virginia, and there's been a couple of questions uh, on Slido that connect with the UK case. Um, one of our um, audience members has um, asked or has mentioned that the UK has been described as an experiment with its approach to e-cigarettes and increasing rate of decline in smoking rates. Um, we also have a question by Judy Gibson, from also from the audience, that uh, she says, given the success of ENDS, uh, which is supported by the NHS, as a smoking cessation tool and a safer nicotine alternative for smokers, um, and Judy Gibson asks, why is there such a wide disparity uh, uh, at EU level countries? So question for all the panelists first, can um, this UK experiment be considered a success? And secondly, why, why is there such a huge disparity across the EU? Obviously, the, um, the U UK is on its way out of the EU, but still, it's part of the European region. So first, is the UK uh, example a success? And second, what explains the disparity? 
across the, the European region. So perhaps could I um, invite you, uh, uh, Virginia, to first comment on this and then we'll go uh, in the order of the speaker. Well, I think this partly relates to the point that I just made. Um, I think Britain has taken this response because it's it's very much of a piece with its previous uh, response to nicotine products and also the um, importance of stop smoking services within the NHS, which don't exist in in all countries in the in the same sort of way. Um, and I think basically my answer is that the answer lies in history. Um, different countries have different histories of smoking control. They have different histories of responses to nicotine. And um, certainly in, in England, there's always been a, a kind of positive response to nicotine. Um, initially by uh, a group, uh, the, the researcher Mike, Michael Russell, who worked on nicotine uh, way back in the 70s. And that has continued, I think, within UK policy. So really, I'm saying the answer lies in history. Thank you. Uh, Christina, do you want to address these issues? Yes, I, I'm not, I don't know if it's an experiment in England, but I think it certainly is an experiment globally. Uh, I think England is, is, a, is a, I think e-cigarettes may work for, for, for England, the time time will show. Uh, why? Because I think we, we we face. I think it's related to a history what Virginia was was talking about before, and the current context where there is relatively low level of smoking in in England uh, across the the society, and also there is a very high regulatory framework in place. Um, and therefore, I think one of the reasons why, if we talk about the, for example, the increase in, in, in use of e-cigarettes in number of, of European countries, which is quite sharp, and, and the use of e-cigarettes, I think, among the youth in, in England, we, we haven't seen an increase in, in, in use of e-cigarettes in England. And I think it's very much because of a high regulatory framework that England has, right? So I think that this experiment, if we want to call it experiment in England, should be seen in a, in a, in a, in a context, right? And should not be exported intentionally or unintentionally to, to the other countries who have a different context, right? And, uh, and I think the last part where I, I, I take it very personally because I have, I have my relatively small kids where I, I don't want my kids to be, to be sold all kind of unknown products. So there's strawberry and vanilla, and I don't know what tastes, right? So as a, as a mother, I take responsibility and I don't think that this is just the, um, the, uh, uh, an alternative, right? Thank you, uh, Anka. Thank you. Um, I, I do share your feelings, Christina, <laughs> when it comes to promoting the new products to, to children. Um, I, I would comment uh, on the UK case from a complementary uh, perspective, uh, and that is um, the, the UK, England, has been at the very top of uh, FCTC implementation from almost the very beginning. And it has had most FCTC and most Empower uh, package policies in place for a long time now. Uh, so if I could use the cultural uh, argument, the culture of smoking was not as uh, pronounced and uh, the tobacco industry influence has been denounced for a very long time and tobacco industry interference has has started to be denormalized quite early so uh, i would also put it into into that particular context the uk has been a very successful country in uh in tobacco control policies um so i i will stop uh, i will stop here but th th the point is <sighs> 
it's it's one of the few countries in the world where FCTC has been very very well implemented. So in that case, let's let's focus on the FCTC implementation uh, everywhere because that might provide very good framework and very good answers for other challenges as well. Thank you, Anka. Anka, I was struck by something that you said in your presentation, which was about what explains cultural change. And you, 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 you present, I think, very nicely that on the one hand, cultural change can open the door to regulatory change, but in other circumstances, regulatory change can be uh, an entry point for cultural change to occur. And you gave the example of the uh, ban in, uh, of smoking in, in public places. I'm asking this because uh, uh, our audience seems to want to know more a little bit about how does cultural change happen in this case one of our anonymous uh, audience members asks why is smoking no longer cool why why how is this cultural change come about i would probably ask this is it still cool or else are there new forms of coolness about the consumption of tobacco products so a question for all of you because i think there's also connects with with a broad historical trajectory so i think this can be also useful and interesting for you to comment on so starting with you anka if you if you uh, okay, well, I'm not a culture historian, so I think uh, the, the, the theory of culture change perhaps is something uh, left to Virginia to, to explain more. Um, but I, I use this analogy. Um, it is very hard to raise your children in the middle of a shopping mall and, to and tell them uh, that shopping is bad. And uh, this, to me, goes to the to the core of of uh, the issue. Um, you, um, it's it's about changing norms, right? Uh, it's about uh, tobacco was the norm, and tobacco will not be the norm. And we're in a transition now; we're somewhere in the middle. But the direction of going is where tobacco is not the norm, and. Experience shows and evidence shows and history shows that the FCTC and policies to reduce demand and supply of tobacco and to reduce the tobacco industry's interference have been successful in delivering that kind of society that we want. Now, we're not there yet. Unfortunately, smoking or gestures similar to smoking are still um, are still uh, promoted, especially now on the internet, social media, uh, in movies and TV shows. Uh, it is unfortunately not uncool enough, uh, but the direction of travel should be towards uh, eliminating it. As long as it's seen as just something that people do, uh, it will continue to be something that people do. Thank you. Um, Christina, do you want to... I think, I mean, very, very short answer to your question, is, is smoking still cool? I, I, I definitely don't think that smoking is cool. This is also, I think, reflected in the, in the, in, among the friends of my kids on my, based on my opinion polls, um, random opinion polls. I think it's very much related to 20th century. I mean, it's a passé in a, in, in a way, in many ways. And I do think also that looking at, for example, Australian example, where the the, the, the number of, of young kids or, or youth, say, um, uh, smoking is, is, is extremely limited. I mean, it's, 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 it's below, below 5%. Um, so it, it's, it's dying out, right? Because the regulatory measures have been shut and they have been driving also the culture where there is no smoking at public places. There is very little smoking at private places impacted by the for the regulation of smoking in public places. There is no publicity, there is no point of sale displays, right? So the, the kids growing up um, in their homes, in their schools, on the streets and environments, they, they don't know, they don't see, they don't smell smoking, right? So, so it doesn't exist for them, right? They don't ask for it if we don't offer it to them. So, so it's, it's a non-issue, right? And I think this is my dream, right? To, to really make sure that the smoking is not cool and it never becomes cool. Thank you, Christina. Virginia, over to you. 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting issue. I think culture and regulation have a, a very close relationship. And if we look back to, say, the 1940s, the 1950s, um, and we've been, ha if we were having this sort of gathering, we all would have been smoking. Everyone would have been smoking around the table. So that's a huge change that's um, taken place over 50, 60 years. Um, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, the discoverer of the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, used to keep a box of cigarettes in his office to offer people who came in to see him. And he said it would be impolite not to offer somebody a cigarette. So all those sort of social norms have totally, and that has been a very long-term process, but also it can happen quite slowly. And an example of that is the smoking ban, which Anka talked about, where in the UK, certainly policymakers were worried that uh, it, it wouldn't be accepted, that people would uh, rebel against it. But in fact, they all accepted it very easily. So, you know, it's a, an interesting relationship, I think, between what happens in terms of regulation and how that changes culture. Thank you, Virginia. There's been a couple of questions about harm reduction. Um, should smokers who can't quit be encouraged to go for products that are deemed safer? I mean, the question is whether they're safe or safe or safer or not. Is another one, but should the, um, should we be looking at some sort of uh, harm reduction principle in the same way as one of our audience members has put it? Much same way as happened with seat belts in cars. Should we also seek to do harm reduction, or should emphasise more harm reduction um, in the case of um, of tobacco control? So, um, can I perhaps start with Christina here? I think I think it's a tall question, and I think this is namely the what I said before. I think we, I think as a global health community, to some extent, I think we have been split. We we don't necessarily agree on the on the harm reduction. I personally do think that the heavy smokers, uh, adult heavy smokers, who would probably never quit um, because it's 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 as difficult as we know. If we could get those people on only on e-cigarettes and they stop completely the, the, the cigarettes, so not to dual use, smoke cigarettes and e-cigarettes, but if they would drop the cigarettes and, and get the, the, the in from the pharmacy the e-cigarettes on a very regulated manner, I think this could be a solution uh, for heavy smokers. Uh, and this is a, a Christina opinion here because I think in terms of WHO, it's not the WHO's official position. Um, so I, I personally believe that, that this could be a solution in, in, in certain groups of the society, uh, but I don't uh, believe, um, as of yet at least, because I, I haven't seen very, very credible evidence that, that indeed that the single use of um, what does the single use of, of e-cigarettes do because most of the time we do see the dual use um, of, of those products in an interchangeable way. But, but I also do think that the publicity, what we're seeing, promotion, what we're seeing to the young people and to the kids on e-cigarettes in a number of countries, also in European region, this I find completely unacceptable. And, and I think this is the marble of men coming back. Uh, what we saw many years ago, this is exactly the marble of men, what we have been fighting for years and been quite successful coming back. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Anka, do you want to say something about this? Um, well, my first, my first thought when I heard the question was, well, cars don't kill half of their drivers. Uh, so I think the analogy is, um, it's, it's an interesting analogy, but there's nothing in this world like tobacco is. And um, so that, that was my, my, first, uh, my first thought. Um, uh, my, my view, um, well, my organization's uh, view on harm reduction is we need to focus on tobacco. Tobacco kills so many people that if we lose focus on that, 
it's, uh, we are going to lose ground in, in the advances that we've been, we've been making. Um, and uh, as, a, as, an, as an additional point that I would make, uh, I think there's a very fine balance between the individual benefit and the societal benefit. Um, there is, it's, there's very clear evidence that there will be individuals that benefit from uh, harm reduction. Will the society benefit from, from that? And does that mean that uh, this particular strategy should be extended to the population level? I think that is a choice that depends very much on the cultural and policy environment of countries. Uh, but it would be wrong to use it as a one-size-fits-all one solution. It, it would probably be quite detrimental. Thank you, Anka. Regina, do you want to comment on this issue? Yes, I think um, it's interesting how harm reduction has come back onto the agenda in the in the tobacco field in some ways. I mean, it was on the agenda in the very early days, the idea of trying to produce what was then called the safer cigarette, uh, which was a discredited strategy. Um, but I think it's come back um, in a different way in the last 10, 20 years, partly through e-cigarettes, um, but also the influence of harm reduction in the drugs field um, post HIV, I think also has to be recognized. I think that's been quite a strong um, impetus in some countries, certainly in the UK. Thank you. Um, so one of the issues, one of the interesting and unusual, I think, ish things about the Framework Convention of Tobacco Control was the participation of and the, the wide participation of civil society. And I wanted to ask a question specifically about how do you see the mobilization of, of the continued mobilization of civil society in order to tackle some of these challenges that we've identified here today. And this speaks to also a question from one of our audience members, Ian Gray, who asked, who has spoken about examples of alternative models to secure compliance, such as through the mobilization of civil society. How would you see um, the continued participation or the possibilities or potentialities of participation of civil society in order to tackle these challenges that we've uh, identified here today? So perhaps starting with Anka on this one. Uh, um, uh, I, I mean, I. I work in a civil society organization, so I can only have good words to say about the role that we uh, that we must play in uh, in uh, the implementation of of the framework convention on tobacco control. Um, it's a it's an interesting question because you know Europe is a you know relatively rich region, and yet uh, the the civil society organizations that we work with are usually understaffed underfunded and in the end uh, if it, at, in a in a big lobbying city like Brussels, you can count on two hands the people who are able to advocate on tobacco control in most european capitals you 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 don't even reach uh, uh, one hand to count them, so you don't need more than one. So um, th there is strength in numbers, and we come together in coalitions, and we uh, we we support uh, each other quite a lot. Uh, but this is a chronic uh, this is a chronic uh, challenge that we that we are facing. So while civil society participation is is very important, we do uh, we do face challenges and. Um, this is increasingly the case because tobacco control is moving uh, away from the pure realm of public health and ministries of health into other governmental departments uh, that have more uh, traditional business links. If you want the economy that finance agriculture, those who don't necessarily have the, the public health, uh, a public health culture, if you want. So it is increasingly challenging, um, uh, and we keep on we keep on working, but it is not easy. <laughs> Thanks for this insider view of civil society and tackling these challenges. Perhaps for uh, 
bit of a more outside of you, uh, Christina. I feel myself very much outsider, but very much also insider. Um, but 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 I think civil society. I mean, I I think we haven't been we we wouldn't been here with the FCTC 15 years on if civil society hadn't been there negotiating for the treaty and making sure it gets adopted by the World Health Assembly back in 2003. So, so I think, and then taking this to a country level, because a global treaty is great, but it has to be turned from the paper, from the legal agreement into action at the country level. And my work with, with countries has clearly demonstrated that the civil society, they can raise the awareness among people why it is needed and what is needed. They can also criticize the government for inaction, because I think we have to remember that in many cases, I think people want more tobacco control. They want the smoke-free air uh, in public places, less ads, and etc. And I think the policymakers are, are sometimes much more hesitant than the general population, right? They also, civil society, I think they are very clearly also involved in adoption of a strong policies, but also at the, at the level of implementation where I think Ian Gray was putting this question, right? Absolutely. To make sure that what gets on the paper, what gets adopted in the parliament, also gets into the into reality. I think the way forward here is as a hearing anchor that it is difficult, it's underfunded and unattentioned, is that I think we have to find the new new allies here from the other sectors, the civil society working in other sectors, connections between tobacco use, mental health, tobacco use, environment, um, air pollution, uh, tobacco use and agriculture. I think those are the allies which are existing, we're aware of each other, but there uh, is a lot more space to, to take the action and, and work together. Thanks, Christina. Virginia? Yeah, just, um, I, I would agree. I think the, those sorts of coalitions would be important in the future. Just to make a historical point, I think um, activists to organizations, civil society have been important right from the start. Certainly in the UK, the Royal College of Physicians set up um, ASH, Action on Smoking and Health, in the early 1970s because it recognized that doctors alone um, couldn't take it forward. It needed that kind of broader coalition in society as a whole. And I think governments have sometimes used uh, that type of civil society organization as a way of counterbalancing uh, the influence of uh, commercial interests so that they tried to strike a balance between the two. Thanks Virginia. Uh, we're running out of time and there's still a few questions on Slido that haven't been addressed. Could I encourage all our audience members to uh, fill in the poll that's uh, on the tab on your Slido uh, box and also leave your email address. And uh, if your question hasn't been answered, uh, we will endeavor and the panelists will endeavor to address you, your questions. Apologies, I could not squeeze everyone in, but our time is limited. So um, just to, uh, to, send, to give you a reminder that the next webinar of this cultural and health series is going to take place on 7th of May 2020. So that's the Thursday after next at the usual time. Uh, 12 British Standard Time or um, 1 p.m. Central European Standard Time. The, time, the theme of the seminar will be um, the role of culture in defining and advancing well-being. So a reminder, please fill in the evaluation form. This is available under the poll section on the slider box. I hope you enjoyed uh, this seminar. I certainly did enjoy uh, the, our discussions. I want to thank our panel members for their insights and their discussion. Also thank all of our audience members for their uh, very interesting questions. So up until our next seminar, stay well, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>